battery died, I thought. Yeah, you turned it on the battery. No, it, it didn't record anything at all. Yeah. <laughs> so you did turn it on because it was on at the start. Yeah. Maybe you didn't no, I think, it, I, think yeah. I left it like this, but it didn't oh. record it, right? Um, so, it's not in color, so we just have to make do with it, right? So, good afternoon. And, um, do you have any questions about the coast dynamics and what you're going to do? Like that? Oh. Uh, I was just reminded that there's homework. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll send the homework assignment uh, in the week. So, right. so, so we can get started with the, with the topic today. Right? The topic today, I think it's pretty interesting, pretty fun. It's kind of vaguely related to what we're going to do. Um, it's vaguely related because it doesn't appear like it's related. But it's, it's the underlying theme uh, affects everything we do with, with video. Right? So essentially, we're trying to figure out, first of all, what human beings can see. How, how do these things work? Yeah, we, 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 we all like color. I mean, I think color, colorful stuff is one of the reasons why people you would think like multimedia and stuff. So, but there are a lot of restrictions, and and, and it, you know, in terms of what I can see, what what you can print, what you can show on the screen, and what have you. And those are all opportunities for us to do stuff, right? If you had a perfect eye vision where we can see all the wavelengths that are possible, then you would be in a lot worse shape than what we are, in, right? So that that's that's what I'm I'm gonna kind of talk about today, and then talk a little bit about some of the image formats and how the these are, and we'll build on that in subsequent lectures. Right. So this is clearly not the, not the class to learn about human vision. I mean, obviously, it's somewhere in psychology or whatever. So I'm going to give a one slide vision uh, uh, idea of what, what human beings can see. I think the human eye can see around 300 to 700 nanometer. Um, people either talk about 400, I think the book talks about 400 nanometer, but there's newer work which shows that you can see all the way from 300 to 700 nanometer, right? And one is, one is you know, the, the um, blue to the Bibgia, the, 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 the rainbow colors, right? And the way we see that is we have these uh, cones in our eyes which are receptive to different colors. And we don't e e have equal amount of all of those, right? So we have a lot more of the red. So we have, for every 40 red, red cones we have, we have 20 green and one blue, right? So we can barely see blue, right? And, and I think they think that it's, it's, a, it's pretty late in the evolution that we started to have this notion of, of blue. So blues, we are very weak on that, right? But there's also some theory that shows that the more of something, the less of it you feel, right? I forget what the exact wording is. So actually, you can differentiate a lot more in blue than in red. You can see a lot of red, but you can differentiate. The, the blue is more of a um, more of a variation, right? So you can't just throw the blue out, you know, because you'll, you'll notice that the blue is getting fully trapped. And the eye works by differencing, not by exactly seeing certain colors and you know, you, you, you've probably seen those things, like you know, I can only see on a very narrow angle, and it cannot see details. It cannot see details as well as we think we can, right? And the details are essentially what is called high frequency. So if you see a lot of little changes in a, in, a, in a picture, you can't see it, right? And we use that in JPEG to get better, better compression, right? We, we kind of throw out different parts, and you, you throw out, tend to throw out parts that you cannot see, right? So, and we are more sensitive to green because even though I said we can see red, blue, and green, the red ones can see the green because they, it's kind of overlapping in some extent. So we can actually see a lot of green, right? Because green excites two of these things except one, right? So, of course, it's a very condensed view of like a whole fields of people and doing these things, but but the essential idea is human eye is not perfect. I mean, what we see as color, we see like little bits and pieces, and lots of stuff happens on the brain to, to make us look like we're actually seeing something, rather than on the up front of the eye, eye perspective. So that means you can get away with a whole bunch of stuff, because the processing is happening on the back, not on, the, on your eyes. Right? 
And the way you see some object, obviously, means it has to be lit, right? If it's, if it's a dark room, you cannot see whether it's uh, red, or, red or blue, right? And that shows up in terms of the kind of displays you have, right? So the, this, this screen is being illuminated by that light to give you a certain color. So these are, um, so the light is illuminating these things, or the, the display itself can uh, send out the colors for you, right? So for example, your, your monitor, it's itself illuminating, right? Because it, for some reason, it has lights that gives light to you. When you see a printout or something, the color depends on what other light you have. So if you have a color printout here, it depends on what the room uh, lighting is, right? So that 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 goes into play in terms of how you how you match these things. Ideally, what you would like to do is have a notion of some color, and how do you give it to a user, right? So if I if I draw a color a circle which is a notion of red, how do I make sure that you see it as red? That's what we are. That's the goal of all these systems, right? So if you write a program which somehow defines the notion of red, how does it show up on your monitor so it can look red? How does it look? How do you make it such that all monitors it looks red? How does it make sure that all print it looks red? Right? And you may notice that it's not excessively true. So some sometimes some some red looks different than something else. And how many of you taken a color printout where you it looks really good on screen but really really bad on the on the printer, right? How many of you have faced that problem? How many of you actually went beyond that to figure out what, what happened? Yes? Uh, when you're out of red on okay. the printer, okay. it looks pretty bad. <laughs> well, so, no, I mean, like, if, if things, everything works fine, right? You, you, everything works, but you still, it doesn't look like that. So if you're like taking a, a, a photograph to get it printed on one of these services, right? The pictures don't look good at all. And you look at the, the the commercial pictures, you know, the the billboard and stuff. They look awesome, right? And you, can, you just cannot get them, right? I don't know, I don't know if, you, if you look at those. It, it's something sad there, right? Yeah. A lot of times, the bigger problem is the monitor, the the monitor that you're looking at the pictures on, mm -hmm. because um, I know for movies, for example, where they do they do special effects, they constantly calibrate them, you know. Once a day, once a week. Yes. So that's the best way we are coming to right now. Right. So, so that's the notion, right? So the your source has the notion of some color, but when it has to be printed, it has to be what you call calibrated, right? Um, so if you get there, there are two ways to get color, right? So for monitors and and, and, and these things, you have you typically have uh, three colors: red, green, and blue, and they are additive colors, right? So red and blue mixed to get magenta and, and so on, right? So that's how your screen gets a color. So you, you have a certain mixture of colors, and that should get you all the colors that you would want, right? In, in excuse case, I said that it's not that simple, but in general, that's the idea. Print works on the opposite side. Print works on subtractive colors, right? So the basic colors that you use are cyan, blue, and magenta. Obviously, you can't see the difference as much here, and that's part of the problem here, right? But essentially, the idea here is yellow is absence of uh, blue, right? And uh, magenta is absence of green. And cyan is absence of red, right? So this one is absence of <coughs> green, and this one is absence of red. So the intersection would be blue, right? Because this one would have taken out the greens. And this one would have taken out the reds, so what is left is blue. The intersection would have been where everything is taken out, so it should be black. Does that make sense? So this is how you generate your colors on print. So when you take when you do a color printer, color printers don't print in red, green, and blue. They print in um, cyan, magenta, and yellow. That's because they are not self-illuminating. They need some other light to to make them glow, right? So if you send white light, right? If you want to modify the white to red, you have to take out the green and blue, right? And that's why you need on, on print subtractive colors. You cannot create red, 
right? So the basis is white is, is presence of all colors, and black is the presence of no color, right? So if I give you white light, and if you want to show something in red, right? Over here, what you do is you have a red light. So here, it's, it's created by three light bulbs. You know, one is red, one is green, one is blue. So you have red, because you actually have a bulb. Whereas in the print case, you have white light coming. To get red, you have to get rid of the colors which prevent it from being red, which is blue and green. And the way you do that is you have these three base colors. And then so this is red. Essentially, it's cyan and um, sorry, it's magenta. Yes, magenta and yellow, right? And so you, you, and typically you don't just, so the black is not really black because the print ink is not perfectly cyan blue or whatever. It's, it's, a, you know, it's, 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 it's a group or something. So you typically have a black as a separate thing to get real black. True black, you don't have to mix it like this to get the true black, right? So this is how you generate your science, and, I mean, the, those colors and this color. Right? So these are interesting stuff, and to, like, even without like, you know, trying to see how it fits into multimedia, but because most of you have look at something which is colored, right, in, in, in print or what have you. So the first thing to note is these things are not linear, right? Your, your screen monitor's color light is not linear, meaning like if you send 1% of signal, you don't get 1% brightness, 2%, 2% brightness, and so on. So if, you, if everything was linear, you would get something like this color, the, this line, sorry, right? Which means that if you want shades of red, shades of blue, shades of green, what, what have you, right? And suppose I, I, I split the, the speed, the, the shades of red from 0 to 100, right? I cannot send one number to the, a single number to the, the monitor and expect it to show up, right? What typically happens is, like, say the monitors have a profile like this, which basically says that for a while you can give signal, but the monitor doesn't light up all that much. And towards the end, it kind of catches up. Right? You might have noticed that if you if you're doing looking at uh, some good radio, right? If you look at a radio and if it has a dial which goes from one to hundred, right? If you put it at ten, you can probably not hear hear anything at all, right? Or maybe if you notice like yeah, these things if you go to ten, you can't just hear anything, twenty, you can't hear anything, thirty, suddenly you can start hearing something and then things go on. Right? So that's the sort of thing. So the, these these Mechanical things need some level of excitation to make, make things happen. So what you do is you correct them, right? You correct them by kind of pushing it, matching it up a bit, so that hopefully these two match up to give you the, the milk color, right? And that's called gamma correction, right? So essentially, depending on the particular device that you're operating on, you have to figure out what's the profile of how the display shows your your shades, and then you have to find out what's the inverse of that and try to apply that, right? And if these two perfectly match, then you would get the perfect shading. So if I have shades of red, the shades that I want is what you will see. The shades that I want in whatever color is what you will see, right? So that's the theory behind gamma correction. The practic practicality of that is these functions depend on the particular how, how you make these things work. For print, for you know, for, for printer stuff, this is a log logarithmic um, graph. And this is the stuff for monitors. Monitors have this kind of a profile, right? To be accurate, this is a profile for a CRT monitor, not necessarily for your L C D monitor, right? So all of them depend on how you eliminate them, how this monitor works, and all those things. So if you ever looked at your monitor specs, there'd be a gamma, uh, they talk about the gamma and stuff. Essentially, you have to play with these things to figure out what is the exact color that you want to be fixed, right? This is one way you'll get tripped up, right? So if your monitor was set in a certain gamma, the way, so the, you take a picture, right? And then you try to display it on your screen, right? And then you try to display it on your printer. Unless these things are all coordinated into the right set of things, 
whatever sees that you see on your screen may not look good on the on the printer, right? You have to compensate for these, right? So it may turn out that even if it didn't do a compensation quite well, on a particular PC it may be okay. How many of you done gamma correction on your device? That much, that much. What, what, what kind of machines do you guys use? Um, PC, I, I do video cards and the driver can do okay. gamma correction. And often I change the gamma correction when I have scenes that I'm displaying that are unusually dark. Okay. And I need to be able to make out the colors. So if you don't do the gamma correction right, right, the initial part of the image, the, the darkness band, would look very dark. Right? The, the, the shades would look darker. Right? And so, and you, you said you did, right? No, you, you said. Yeah. Okay. I've messed with it. There are graphics card settings. If you download the drivers, okay. And all stuff. So, the, I mean, once you get into this thing, this thing gets really muddy, right? Because like I think Mac by default would make it to 1.8. PCs don't do anything, and then depending on so, so if I want to send a picture to you, right, and I want to be kind, so I want it to look nice on your picture, I know you're not going to look at all this stuff, right? Then I have to, I have to pretend, I have to assume what kind of monitor you have. So if I know that you have a Mac and you didn't change anything, you're probably going at gamma of 1.8, right? So I can send the picture in such a format that it'll look good for you, right? I could I could do that, and it'll be, a, it'll be a weird thing, right? I mean, it won't be exactly predictable because you, you might have actually change the gamma for all you care. So the picture which looks really, really nice for me would look horrible for you, right? So when they were building the, the television standards, right, the television cameras itself don't have any notion of gamma. I mean, they pick up whatever color they, which is not there. So somebody has to do the camera correction. So back in the 40s or 50s, whenever they were de developing the NTSC standard, somebody has got to do the camera correction because they know that most of the people at that time had CRT. Actually, not most. You know, all of them probably had CFTs, right? I don't think they had LCDs or something back then. Right? So they were going to send it on to the CRTs. So they have to decide whether they should send a pure signal to you or send something, a signal which is already gamma coded by whatever number, right? So that your your TVs can be simple. Your TVs cannot, does not do gamma correction. The gamma correction is done at source, right? Not source, I mean, at the television station. So they take the camera contents, they apply these gamma corrections, and then send it up to your home, so it will look fine on your TV without any kind of correction. Okay? So they decided that 2.2 is what NTSC will go by, and Pal and Sikram use 2.8 okay, to send it to your home. Right? And we can start with that right now, right? because if you go into LCD TV, they have different gamma stuff. If you go into projection, so I have no idea what the gamma is for this projection unit. But NTSC already changes everything to 2.2. So if I were to display the my NTSC objects on this projected over here, right? I have no idea how these interactions really play out, right? And they had to take it over to HDTV too. So HDTV, even though it's modern, even though it's newer and everything, still would do these things upfront on the picture, right? So they're gonna start with that, you know, because back in the Israel CIPs. So NTSC, which is the, 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 the signals you get in the US, they also do some, some other things. So one of the things that they noticed is across the cultures, regardless of what your skin color is, people tend to like reddish figures more than bluish or greenish things, right? So most of the commercial, the, the, the consumer cameras that you buy add a little red, red ting, tinge to the pictures, right? Because people then like it. Because like the camera manufacturers want to sell cameras. They don't care if it if it's if it's false or whatever, right? So all these cameras add a little red tinge to it. NTSC adds a little red tinge to it. So if you look at a, 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 a reference stream sent through NTSC, you'll have slightly reddish tone with this gamma added, right? So people would think that these are good. Um, people people like that. So it's kind of hard to undo all those things. If you have one of those, your, your TV, which are not like the really, really low end, right? You may see these options called color coolness. You know, there's like a blue, I mean, warm, natural, or um, whatever they call it, one of those things. 
So if you see those things on your TV, right? So there'll be one which is like natural, one, one which is kind of thing. Sony calls it warm or something, right? I think warm is the real color, right? But you're so tuned to it. If you try ever try to put your TV in the real color, you won't like it because it looks very bluish. Because you're used to seeing it in a slightly reddish form. Right? Um, yeah, check it out. I mean, your TV probably has 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 the little option, right? So the the real problem right now is I, I, I told about all this gamma and all those all those stuff. So how do we go? I mean, like you know, how do you make sure that the colors all remain the same? Right? How how do you go from your print to um, your you know LCD and all those things, right? So there's a lot of work done in uh, early 30s, and one of the offshoot is this chromatic graph. Right? I'm not going to go into the details of what this means and how it's generated and all those things. Um, essentially, the idea here is this: the the graph you see is the colors that your human eye can see, right? And each of the different frequencies are on the outer edge. So red is over here, green is over here, and and uh, blue is over here, right? The one of the properties of this graph is there are other properties, you know, like you know the x and y are the different coordinate axes and, and, and what have you. One of the properties is if I choose a reference here and if I choose a reference here, right, all the shades of using adding, adding those two would fall on this side of the line, towards inside of the line. Right? So if I if I were to use let's say I'm using RGB monitor and my green happens to be here and Blue happens to be here, and red happens to be here. So everything inside this is all I can show. Right? Everything outside this I cannot show. Right? Because the, the 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 source is not green enough, or red enough, or blue enough. Right? So everything inside is the one I can show. And somewhere around here is a white zone. Right? So you have to define what that what that is for your thing. So your software has to figure out what it wants to call as white to kind of um, calibrate itself, right? So, what, so this is a way to kind of show what your screen is supposed, your, your display device is supposed to show. So if I can draw some graph and say this is my monitor, right, that means that this is all the color I can show, right? So if I had a graph which is over here, that means I, I cannot show red, right? So if you look at this picture, right, one of the things you'll, you'll notice is this screen looks all like the same. At least for me, the green looks kind of, so I can see a lot of changes here, but as I go towards like this corner, right, you don't see much of a shade, right? You, you notice? Maybe you should turn off one thing. Right? You'll notice that there's a lot of variation here, and there's not a lot of variation here, right? And that's exact, precisely the point, right? Because we don't know what's the the graph for this particular uh, um, unit, right? If it if it happened to be somewhere like here, right? That means that you cannot really show anything on this end. Yet. So what you do is you project whatever is on this end. To something which you can show inside, right? So essentially, all the stuff here is outside your this particular uh, display stuff. So essentially, you're mo you're showing this as green, right? So it's not like that this graph cannot actually graph is actually wrong, right? The, the, the digital data for this particular figure is complete. It's showing something here. We just can't see it. So we vaguely use all the stuff in, in all, all the things we do is because this is great. If we can show all these colors, that means I need to be able to show all these variations. But if your your TV can your monitor can only show this much, then I can actually throw out all these other components. And you won't notice a thing. Right? In this case, the you, like you know, all these shades you can't just see. I mean there's, there's, there's just no way you can see. So I can throw throw all of those out. 
you had a question? What does CIE stand for? Um, Color Institute something oh. is French, right? Um, there, there are different ways of like in projecting these colors. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm just giving a very broad overview because the the, the, the differences are subtle, right? Uh, subtle and, and and what have you. But the essential thing is you can't see the whole thing. It depends on what kind of a device you have, right? So actually, you know, so, so the, essentially, this is the this is the deal. So, depending on what your monitor can do in terms of red and blue and green, what have you, right? It defines the the enclosing triangle, right? Which defines what you could see. So, if you had a monitor which that with with that capabilities, you cannot see anything outside, or you cannot see any variation outside. So, technically, you cannot see anything. So, you don't want the computer, the, the, the monitor manufacturers don't want to send a display where all those things look black, right? So they project all these contents back into here. So you see something, but it's not the true self, right? You may notice it if you, if you try to fiddle with your monitor, if you make it like too colorful or something, right? It'll look all washed out because it's, it's beyond what it's supposed to, try to do, right? This is not even talking about the other part, which is like you have to make sure the brightness is right. Uh, if any of you have done any kind of like art, work kind of stuff, right? You need to make sure the brightness is right, make sure the reflectance is right, and all those things. So that is, it's, it's very involved, right? The, the artist would do some of those things. So when you see the, the, the professionally made posters and stuff, right, they're, they're trying to do this matching very, very seriously, right? And that's one of the reasons why you need Adobe Photoshop rather than um, your run of the mill something. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along, right? It's not a simple, trivial thing of, I want to show red, here show red, right? So anything which can make sure that these things all match would, would, be, would look good, right? Now, all those things don't have to have this triangle thing, right? So you, you could think of another display which uses, instead of three, like, you know, five or something, five different color sources to get the right content. So it may have more complex pattern, right? So theoretically, it's possible for you to have Let's say it's a red, green, and blue, right? You have like something which is like which can span any of those, right? So it can actually give you any color that you want, right? The practical practicality of that is that that monitor would be so expensive that you can't afford that, right? So one of the things you, in terms of the. Uh, so monitors actually look more similar to this one. So if you look at the different what is expected from monitors and LCDs and all those things, the graphs look a lot like this, right? Film can actually color, can actually has a much wider range than your than what your monitors can show. Right? On the other hand, film does not have the resolution power of your monitor. So if you want to see two dots which are exactly very very small you would want to go with your monitor, your, your LCD panel or, or what have you. Uh, but there's the, the print, the film can actually have much wide variation of color. In fact, it, it can practically cover the whole range, right? So you can never match your print with something looking online, right? So if you take a photograph in, let's say, in a, in a slide, slide format, right? How many of you use slides? Apparently, slides are, 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 are obsolete, right? I was trying to buy a, one of those slide projectors recently. Two years back, you can see them on the shelf. And I was in b &H, which is one of the like, big, super big stores in New York. Um, the person did not know what it was, which is kind of strange because it's, you know, <laughs> bits. So slides were the thing um, like a couple of years back, and now they're completely gone. So if you look at slides, right? Slides is a positive film. So if you look at slides, you can actually see through them. It's like the movie kind of stuff, right? They have much, much wider range, right? You can make make a print out of them in a, in a, in a, photo, in a, in a, in a photograph of paper. How many of you actually try to look at slides, print, and on your monitor, right? Forget about you, if you haven't seen slides, how many of you have seen photographs and them scanned into a monitor and look at them? Right? It's not a not the common thing, right? Which one do you like? Uh, 
completely unscientific, but you know, yeah. the monitor usually looks better to me. What? <laughs> Generally, the, I like the print better. Okay. Yeah, the print too. So how? Okay, I, I was gonna, I was gonna say monitor, but what? How do you guys print? You can go first. Yeah. How, how how do you print? Like what what size do you print, and where do you get the printer and all those things? Um. Like four by six. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just from Walgreens or something. Okay. Like the Kodak ones, like I, don't know, I feel they look better sometimes on the screen. Maybe it's the quality of the scanning, but I don't know. wow. Wait, if you're going from like scanning a picture, then I think the picture itself is better. But if you're going from a digital picture to a printer, that's different, right? It's different. Yeah, if you have a film camera. Okay. And go get your film developed. The prints, and then you scan those pictures, and the prints are always going to look better than what you scanned them. Yeah. Well, something that I generally do, which maybe is outside of the realm of the question, is uh, digitally you can enhance the picture because you may have not taken a perfect picture with the film camera. So, mm -hmm. so the, the, the two things, right? One is, I don't know how many of you like seen in the back, you know, back in the days when you developed some negatives, you put them in like fluids and like the dark room and all those things, right? Most of the stores you look around, so the reason why I was asking where you did that, right? Most of these small and all those things. They essentially develop the, the, the negatives, they scan it in, and the big thing you see up there is a printer, right? Not not a photographic projector thing. Right? So the, the big device you see up there is a printer. So it's already digitized and digital one is getting printed there, right? They no longer do the what you do in the you know, back in the days where you have projection system and then you have photographic paper, right? That's not done, right? Um, the, the enhancement, right? So what do you think is, is enhancement, right? There, there are obvious enhancements, like you want to get it off somebody so you kind of like erase it up and put something on top of it, right? That, that's enhancement where you're changing the, the picture, right? Otherwise, if you take a picture of me and you're enhancing, right? What is it that you're trying to do? Get more clear colors of the picture. Yeah. Uh, I've used it when I have really, really dark pictures and I want to like light it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes some area of the picture is too dark and I can't see much. So yeah, that's so what you put. So you essentially, had, yeah, you had a point, right? Well, no, when you say enhance, what were you referring to? Well, like he said, he, he can enhance. When you, what do you do by enhance? Uh, essentially, uh, for instance, often when you take a picture with a camera, you don't, it's not an expensive camera. Well, I ask you because like my whole family's involved in professional photography. Okay. So okay. I just wanted to what, what you, when you say enhance, like, do you just do color correction or color correction, uh, brightness sometimes? Okay. So most, so um, most of these things you're distorting, right? You're distorting to make it look good, right? Um, there's nothing wrong, right? Because we are working with our eyes. I mean, you know, unfortunately, we are stuck with our eyes. So <laughs> if you if you have a, if you have a picture, right? Technically, what what looks really good. Technically, the accurate representation of what was taken may not be what you really like, right? The ones you see in the monitor looks kind of bright and like good, and then you can kind of little enhance a little bit, and then and so you're not the first one to notice that, right? The, the, the whole industry notices that, so they they kind of tweak these pictures to make it look good, right? So they 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 want the normal human being who's taking picture to have it look good, so you add a little bit change. Every step of the way, it's distorted, right? So, but that's good because no one really likes the real picture. The real picture is you look normal and you want to add like this little stuff, right? And one of the reasons why you like the, my theory is like, if you like the, the, the monitor thing is, it doesn't have all this color variation, right? But it, it kind of, you can highlight or uh, uh, bring these things to look good, right? On, on, on the on the NCD panel. Um, I, I actually think the monitors look, uh, things on the monitor look good, even though you know you are only seeing like a little bit of what, what the what the print, prints can do, right? Um, but it can get muddy because if you look at if you if you look at the one hour station, right? If you talk to them and say do not touch this picture at all, just send it through, they'll do something. But 
usually they do this auto enhance if you you know product calls it whatever right uh, whatever little tags they they call you know some premium service or whatever essentially it's doing this um, this heuristics to make distort the image so that it looks good right pictures are not the only thing where you do that right you do that for audio right the whole thing that we're talking about applies to audio too but i'm not talking about that right now right you don't want to hear the real audio as it is made because people don't have enough speakers, good speakers to listen to the stuff, right? So either you distort it on the set or along the way to you know, pump the bass or change the treble or whatever, but essentially you're distorting it so that your ears can now you know, find it more pleasing on the cheaper speakers, right? And so that so th those are all part of what what you do what you when you do encryption I mean uh, compression and stuff because in compression you have a target audience which is a human being right and at, at the end I'm going to ask this question what does it mean when you're doing surveillance and stuff right all this is turned turned towards a human being sitting in front of uh, run of the mill CRT terminal or run of the mill Walgreens uh, printer right it's not turned towards somebody who's sitting in front of a really super duper display, really super duper printer, or what have you, right? So, in terms of the Walgreens printer, right, the number one thing is the picture should look good, it should be cheap, and it should be durable, right? That's all you care about, right? You want the pictures to be durable because it's a big thing, because you know, most people use, tend to use the pictures, right? So, you don't really go for an accurate color presentation because those may fade much more quickly. The other other stuff, which is kind of sort of related, which is uh, kind of, uh, I always find it interesting, right? When you buy a megapixel camera, right? You buy a, uh, I'm assuming most of you have digital camera in one form or the other, right? At least in a cell phone or whatever, right? Um, so they talk about megapixels, right? Have you ever wondered what that, what like? So if you say one megapixel, right, and that's like a thousand by thousand array, right? So do you know how much of the information is actually captured on the on the CCD? Actually, the answer is over here, right? So the the CCD technology it cannot detect colors, right? It, it does not know how to, how to do colors. So essentially, what you do is you put a filter in front of it. So you know, so if you put a red filter, only red light goes through. So this particular CCD will only see red, right? And if you put a green filter, blue filter, what have you. So essentially the CCD can only see one color and you, you filter out the rest of the colors, right? So what you do is, you know, when, you, when you talk about a CCD camera, you have these three masks, right? Green, blue, and red mask. So each pixel only gives you that particular color, right? And like I said, green is something that we can see better because it has, you know, the red and green can, can see the green. Right. It's not really green, that the high green is more of a, a broader thing. So essentially they have twice as much green as red and blue, right? So the mask is more like this. So you have the green mask, the blue mask, and red mask. Or you can think of it like this. You know, like in one row you have green, red, green, red, other other rows, blue, green, blue, green, what 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 have you, right? And then in software you kind of mix them up to get the color. To get to to extra extrapolate to figure out what the color should be, right? So when you talk about one megapixel camera, it only collected like one third of of that information, right? And it's trying to extrapolate them in some sense to get the image that you want, right? So in human, so when you when you when we talk about human, human, uh, you know, can see what resolution and stuff, right? Human beings can actually see in, in, in real colors, not, not, not like these, the fake ones. Right? So each, each bit you can see that. Right? Actually, human beings can see 406 or some levels of color, right? But monitors can only show 256. That's why we have 256 uh, or 24 bit toward the stuff. So. Your, your, your eye can see much more variation than your monitors can ever show, right? But we, we have accepted that a long time back, right? So there's only one manufacturer uh, which makes this chips called Fovian, which is, which, is, which is used in 
sigma, they make like, I think one or two models where each pixel can pick up all the three colors. Essentially, the the, the light goes through them, so you can, you can pick up blue, green, and red. So they advertise it as we have thrice, you know, so it's 10 megapixel, but effectively 30 megapixel, right? Because it's it's actually getting that much information, right? The problem with with this device is since it has to go through all these layers, it gets weaker and weaker, right? So if you're looking at some dark object, then this is not the way to go, because you know, by, by the time it goes through one or two layers, it's gone. So it, it works really well if it's well lit, otherwise it kind of goes away, right? And the, the, the software in these things can make it actually look, look better than these ones, even for the brightly lit case. So I think commercially this is kind of a failure, right? But that's that's the thing, and your um, your slide film, I think, can take 45 million bits of information. If you if you take the slide film and then look at the amount of information it's stored, there is 45 million um, bits of pixels of information. Each one of them has all the colors, all the colors that you can look for, right? So so if you scan it into two to six red, two to three, two to six blue. So essentially, it's 45 times three pixels as compared to a, um, your digital camera, right? So there's still ways to go before we can reach anywhere close to what the what the slide films can can do, right? But nobody really complains about those, right? I, I don't complain. I'm not sure how many people complain. <laughs> How many of you are waiting for the um, 100 megapixel camera? <laughs> guess why you, you won't, you're not waiting? Well, well, I guess if they came out, other ones would be cheaper. Oh, but, <laughs> but, but, but see, see, the problem is, it doesn't matter because we don't have anything to actually show it. Uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> your monitor cannot show it. It lets us take pictures that aren't very accurately pointed, and then take small shots for okay. that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was gonna Which is actually something why you like using high definition. Yes. So, the, the, yeah, thank you. So, so the, the point is, okay, so you, you don't really want to have that high resolution. You don't really care for the high resolution because for most of us, we can't do anything with that. Right? Your your monitors won't show it. Your 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 screens can't show the the coloration that you can you can get. Um, so it'll be some, this expensive piece of equipment that you can you can barely uh, notice. Right? Actually, you, you can't notice. Right? So you could use it to kind of like zoom in on some some of the aspects of of the picture. But so the real future of all these things would be this this goes into photography, right? When you take a, take a picture, you try, tend to focus on some event, right? Ideally, what you would like to do is capture everything here, right? Going beyond the high definition camera kind of perspective, but capture everything in here, and then later focus or do whatever, right? Like if you look at a camera, you know, some, somebody's in real focus, somebody's not in focus, right? There's nothing which prevents you from taking everything and then post-processing it later, right? Sort of like a human eye does it in some sense, right? We, we don't actually we do a whole bunch of nice processing, but essentially that's what you want to do, right? Those kind of devices don't exist because we don't have the ability to capture those, right? But that will be the ideal thing, right? So essentially, you take a picture of this room where you capture everything in this room, no focusing or whatever, and then you do the stuff later to get a two D projection out of it, right? That may not happen for, for quite a bit, but that's that's the future, right? So if you, um, one of the, I think one of the, the, the um, Vannevar Bush, right, the, the, the computer science guy who was doing computer science in early 1900s, um, you know him, right? Uh, I don't know how to pronounce his first name. You 
was in the field of sciences, I think he passed away in 1970, but I think most of his work was in 19, early 1900s, right? He's the first guy who, who developed hypertext. His vision, he called his device called, oh, okay, so I didn't talk about history. It's actually in your book in the first chapter, right? The first known mention of this notion of hypertext where you have something which is pointing to something else, so you go here, and then you kind of magically point to something else, goes to him, right? He, de he designed, a, he, he conceptualized a device called Memex, M-E-M-E-X, where you store all these things and you have a way to kind of point at this stuff, right? There are a lot of people trying to build these kind of devices. His, I mean, obviously, at, I mean, he was envisioning all this stuff, you know, there's nothing called computers or, or, or what have you. But his idea is like, you know, kind of, so the idea, like some of the people at like Microsoft are trying to work on is trying to capture everything around me and then trying to index everything. So I, I blissfully walk around ignorant, but it captures everything around me. And right? then I can kind of search and say, who was the one who was sitting next to me like, with the brown shirt or who was, like, you know, sort of things like that, right? So you can, the whole world is one indexed searchable kind of thing, right? So people give credit to him for no, the other notion of hypertext, uh, a, a very simple form of that is here. But, right. So yeah, so his model of the vision, the, the thing is, you don't have these lenses and all those things. You kind of capture everything around me, and then you you go look at it. And we are nowhere close to getting there, but you know, it's a good goal to achieve. So. Now we get more into like how we can apply a lot of these things we looked at into um, the compression and stuff, right? So essentially, on the top you have some uh, uh, some picture. Now you have to represent it in some form in, in your in your system and then and show it, right? So the RGB is the form that you probably see in the monitors and stuff. Essentially, there's a red component, green component, and a blue component, right? If you mix all of them, you get the the picture that you want, right? And you may notice that you're not really good at seeing the blue component because uh, you can't really focus on the blue component, right? It's not that blue is lighter, I mean brighter or different color, but it's just that you can't see that thing. But you have all these three, right? So if you want to use this as a compression technique, you can compress this, you can compress this, you can compress this, right? But they all have equal amount of information content. So this is good for showing on your CRPs or, or your display device. But each, all of them have the same kind of uh, content. Another way to show color, the, the multiple variations of this, and I'm gonna show the, the one which is sort of what you have in, in your JPEG, JPEG and all those things, right? Which is the YCBCR, right? Yes, the, the format YCBCR, right? How many of you have heard, heard of this or seen this before? Yes, in what context? Um, we were using a FireWire camera okay. last year. Uh, it picked up in my city. So, in non-research context, only if you heard of this in non-research context. Here, yeah, TV. Uh, yes. Sir. Yes. It's an HD TV, like DVD players, the output formats. It's component video. Yes. It's the green, the blue, no. No. No, for it is right, but not green blue. Okay, I, I'm saying that that's the color of the okay. connectors. Okay. It's not so, RGB, but that's the color of the... Yes. So, yeah, it's one of the comp one of the things that you can get out of from your DVD players or what have you, right? In the next section, we'll, we'll go through what are the different connectors, right? So one of the connectors is the analog um, component video, which, is, you know, which used to be the highest quality stuff you can get, right? So essentially you will have three different cables, one yeah, one is green, one is blue, and one is red, I think, right? Um, so those are the YCBCRs. If you have one of those TVs which is connected to, usually connected to a good source like TV player or your uh, cable box, right? If you have one of those, right, this is a good, good thing to try, you know, just take the, the, the CB and CR color, right? And you, you'll see the, the Y component. Why is the luminous component? Why is the basically the, the brightness component, also called the luminous component, which is essentially the black and white component, right? 
So if you split it into YCB and CR, right, you have the, the luminous component and then the, the two color components, right? So you can probably barely notice anything on this stuff, right? The, the, the CB and CR are, are very hard to see, right? But if you mix all those, you get the, the, the other color, right? So when you split, it, split this image into these three formats, right? You'll notice that these two look very muddy and like not bright, right? That's because you can't see it. It's, that it's fault is you, right? Not not the not the, the splitting, right? So since you can't see it, that's great. So what we do is we throw out lots of these components because you can't see it anyway, right? So your JPEG image is basically you're seeing lots of black and white and a little bit of color added because that's all you can see anyway, right? Actually, human eye can, like, when it's dark, you, you only see in black and white, right? But you never really know that, right? So when you're walking in the dark, you're actually seeing in black and white, right? But your brain makes it all look like you're still seeing in color, right? Because you're, you're much more, so evolutionarily, you need to survive, right? Surviving means that you need to notice changes and, and, and difference. You need to run away from danger, right? So. Color is just an added bonus for, which doesn't serve as much purpose as the black and white, right? So very good at like noticing any differences, very good at like noticing black and white. So essentially that's what happens. So if you look at the picture, you know, your Y component looks really bright, and that's because Y is the one you can see, and the other two components can be dropped, right? So your color components are essentially dropped, and you can notice it by, you know, if you have one of the component TVs, you can try playing with that, right? There actually may be one behind this thing too, because this looks like a fairly good system, right? So let's let's move into how these how the representations and and, and uh, how, how the uh, things work, right? So you have the the bitmap or the you know one dot you know black on, on and off format. So essentially, so this is the I don't know how many of you know the story about this picture. If you don't. Look up, right? Because um, it doesn't play by. So the um, if you do it in, in 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 you know in uh, in bitmap format, you know you, you either see black or white. So the black and white pictures look very dark, right? But a lot of technologies where you can only produce black and white. You can't produce shades. One good example is a laser printer, right? Laser printer only prints black or white. It does not print shades. So you have to, essentially this is what you're printing, but you have to somehow make it look like this, which is what you think you're getting because when you're getting, getting printouts. But uh, on, on the other hand, you know, uh, grayscale is, is just the, uh, it's a black and white component. Uh, or you can think of it as, you know, if you do a color image, you take a white component, that's your, um, the grayscale component. So the process by which you change, you do this dithering, or uh, by which your laser printer makes it look like it has it prints shades, is called dithering, right? So it essentially it prints dots, right? And uh, the other problem is your laser printer. If you get like a 1200 DPI printer, and you, you have a digital picture that you took with a um, one megapixel camera, right? One megapixel is you know, roughly 1000 by 1000 pixels, right? So if you print it as this on the printer, it'll show up as less than one inch. Right? It'll, it'll be fairly small. You probably don't want that, right? So you kind of want to blow it up. So when you're trying to blow it up, you have something very similar. You want to make sure that the blown up picture, so when you blow up, what you do is you have one, let's say one black or white dot. That's all your camera picked up. If you want to blow it up and print it as this, one big black thing, right? If you're really far, you won't notice, right? This is, this is how the, the advertising billboards and stuff. But on a, on a printer, you would notice, right? They have to, to figure out how to kind of make this shades from what you have. And over here, the same thing. You know, your, your printer can print dots. How does it make it print shades is the dithering component, right? And that's the reason why HP and all those things are in business. It's not a simple trivial, you know, you just take a pixel and, and all this stuff. So one of the, like, back 
when, you know, 10 years back I was, you know, at, at HP Labs for some, or something. And they spent a whole lot of effort trying to show how the thing should look good. So they don't actually have, so the, the shape of the dots matter, right? So one of the things that they were really excited about is if you have two dots like this, right? If you have another dot which is like at a certain angle, it actually makes it look nicer, right? So they have to make sure that human eye is what it is, paper is what it is. It, it depends on the kind of paper you, you have and, and, and the toner that you have. Paper is what it is, and what are you going to print, right? Are they going to print text or images, right? Because that depends on what algorithm it will do, right? So if you think you're going to print all, all text on a white paper using blah, blah, blah kind of thing, then they spend, you know, you have like the whole HP printer division is trying to figure out how to place these dots such that it looks nice, right? Because the, the, the basic technology of like, you know, paper, making a dot, that's well known. That, I mean, that's, that's nothing new here. And it's defined by the, the, the chemical reactions of how, how big a format you can send, right? So they spend a whole lot on this one, and you can see amazingly a lot of difference on the printer without changing anything. You can send one text, and depending on how these algorithms are, are, how these are placed, it can look really good or really poorly, right? You can have some control over it by, like if you go to the printer setting, you know, they have like pro resolution or fast resolution or text, or, like they have different ways of you accessing this, right? So your printer can never be good for everything because it's, it's actually running a little algorithm trying to Again, trick you into making it look like it's good, right? So nobody wants accurate uh, representation of the thing, right? Actually, it, it is true. If you actually see the real printout on a laser printer, it looks horrible because you see all the artifacts. So you have to change the stuff, and so they they spend a whole lot of time on that. We don't spend time on that, but we use some of these things, right? So the the other the time we have to do this stuff is the 8-bit uh, um, color, right? I'm not sure how many of you remember the days when things were in 8-bit, right? which is not that far back, but a couple of years back, but where were you the uh, bit? Which machine are you running on? Uh, that was back on Windows 3.11. Okay. Well, okay. That's real back, right? <laughs> so if you, if you ran in those days, your, your graphics card can only show 8 colors, right? Eight, eight bits with a couple of colors. So it's not like it can only show two to six set colors. It can only show two to six color combinations at any one time, right? So that's the that's the what the card can do because the 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 color it, it can show us only eight, two to six out of whatever combination you have. So essentially, what they do is they have a color lookup table, right? So you have to have color lookup table, and then it, it figures out what the what the color should show on the screen. So the screen can actually show. 8 bits of red, 8 bits of green, 8 bits of blue, but your application has to choose one of two to six colors, and it'll figure out what, you know, it'll do a math, math lookup, right? So you can either try to have one set of colors which are true for every application, right? And that will be horrible for everybody, right? Or you can choose it such that this particular application gets, gets its two places. So if you do that choosing to your own your own application, that application would actually look fairly decent. I mean, it, it, it's hard for you to tell that it's not 24 bit full color, right? But the flip side is anything which is not using the color map would look horrible, right? So if, if any of you used like X Windows or something back then, you would remember that you move your mouse into the this graphics program, your graphics program will look awesome. Everything else on the side will look horrible. Over, right? You can turn it away, around such that you use the same color map for everybody. In which case, everything will look kind of washed out because you know the, the color maps don't matter. Right? So you actually have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what color map should be done. Right? Most of the people don't understand what color maps are, so we are just unhappy. Right? <laughs> so. If you use one standard color map, right? This is the 24-bit color, and this is the the 8-bit, you know, GIF image, right? And you see, right? Unfortunately, the, this display is 
probably not that good at all, so you probably can't tell that much difference, right? But at least you can tell on the sky, right? The sky looks kind of like, um, like a beach scene kind of thing rather than the smooth effect, right? You could fix that by choosing the appropriate um, color table, and that's a whole bunch of research. So there's a whole bunch of community of people who are trying to figure out how to map a good representative set of two of six colors from this that you can use in the color table such that this will look as good as this one, right? So that's actually a whole field, right? So we, we're we just looking at that from in one slide. But this, um, so if, if you go to the, the SPIE conference, you know, there's a whole bunch of people trying to figure out what to do in, in that context, right? Where it affects you is in terms of GIF, right? How many of you still operate on, on GIF objects? So if you operate on GIF objects, right? GIF is essentially an 8-bit format, right? GIF can only show two of six colors, but it has a notion of a color table. So before it shows a file, it can use a standard color table or internet color table, which is one of the color tables they have, or it can generate a color table. Right? So if you use a tool like Adobe, Photoshop, or something, it'll tell you what color table you want, right? It may call it as internet colors or SRGB or whatever it calls it, right? You can, or you can say optimized or figure out the exact option it calls, right? And Adobe Photoshop can do a really good job of coming up with a, uh, a good color table, right? And that's one of the reasons why these tools like Adobe Photoshop and us still sells, even though you can get knocked off like, you know, Jim or other little tools, right? Because a lot of effort, which, so it's not a trivial thing of, you know, taking an image and compressing it in a chip. Right, that anyone can do, right? Coming up with this nice set of color values such that these ones look really good to you, that's worth that you know thousand dollars or something that they charge for for the software, right? And if you do that then you'll essentially look the same. So the way GIF works, it's pretty dumb, you know, nobody nobody does that anymore. But essentially it's a it's a lossless compression, which means that whatever you've compressed, you compressed, you if you uncompress you get the same, right? It is lossy because if you Took a real picture, which is you know has total range of it, red, green, and blue. It, it already drops down to 256, right? So you lost one, you know, two thirds of the information. But beyond that, GIF file essentially has the the color table, either standard or, or custom that you can have, and it'll do a LGW uh, compression, right? This again goes back to your algorithms class, and um, LGW compression essentially creates um, a fixed set code length for different stuff, right? So if you have repetitions, you try to replace that with fixed size um, code fix, right? As compared to Huffman, where most software gets smaller bits, it's different size bits, right? If you don't remember, you'll probably learn it in your algorithm class, right? But essentially, it's a compression algorithm which is used in GSIS and all those uh, lossless formats, right? It's not that much used that much because the pixel quality is not that good, right? But it's excellent for text. If you have less than two to six colors naturally, if you have a text object, then GIF is the way to go, not JPEG, right? And, and we'll see why in a bit, right? So GIF has its role in, in terms of text and stuff. Um, but these are all bit map formats, and, and GIF is not really used for images. Now, next is the, the JPEG format, which is sort of the, the pseudo uh, standard in, in, in all this stuff, right? Um, and again, I'm not going too much deeply into the, 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 the algorithms for how to do JPEG, right? JPEG uses two, no, two ideas that the, I, I, I mentioned before. Human beings cannot see detail, right? So if you can't see detail, throw out the detail. You can't see color, so throw out the color, right? So that's, that's the claim to uh, thing, right? So, so the way you, you get rid of color is, we know that if you go to YCBCR space, the CB and CR can be dropped, you, you can barely notice, right? So you change your original image, which is in RGB format, to YCBCR, and treat them differently. Treat the 